Welcome to In The Space. I'm your host, Martin Sweeney, and I will be talking with friends, artists, activists, neighbors, and leaders about disability and community. In The Space is a virtual conversation acknowledging and celebrating disability culture and identity in all its history, diversity, and creative self-expression. Our thanks to Pasadena Media for making this broadcast possible. Welcome to another episode of In The Space. Today, we are traveling outside the Zoom room to visit with guest artist, friend of the show, and opulent mobility founder and co-curator, A. Laura Brody. Opulent Mobility began with Laura's first mobility artwork in 2009, which then expanded to a small group show in 2013 and has since expanded into annual shows, including artists from Southern California, the United States, and now globally welcoming artists from across the world. Opulent Mobility 21 is now currently on exhibition here in the San Gabriel Valley and runs through October 30th. The show can also be viewed virtually online at opulentmobility.com. In this episode, we meet up with Laura at the Wingwalker Brewery in Monrovia, California, which is hosting this year's exhibition. I encourage all of you to visit Opulent Mobility 21 in person or online. Don't miss it. It's a fabulous show. Welcome to another episode of In the Space. I am here with good friend Laura Brody. Hi, Laura. Laura is the artist and curator for Opulent Mobility, which you'll learn a lot about uh, today. Uh, we are in the Wingwalker Brewery, which is a location in Monrovia that is hosting Opulent Mobility 21. And we're encouraging everyone to hang out at the Wingwalker Brewery as well as see this show. The show runs through October 30th, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, normally we go to, and do all this on Zoom, but here this is very different for me. We're actually doing this live. Ooh. We're not even wearing masks, but we're both back. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay. Um, Laura, yes. um, I was interested in having you back on the show. Thank you. Because you now have a new show that has just opened up this first week of October. And I'm interested in obviously taking a look at the work as well as learning a little bit more about the artist. Okay. You and I have had many conversations about art and disability and how they intersect. I'm old school, and so when I was first introduced to the disability community, it was before the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So my immediate connection was political. And most of the people that I were meeting were also in this political space because prior to the ADA, uh, there was a need to be able to create legislation that supported the human and civil rights of people with disabilities. So that is like a really monolithic force shaping people's identity and actually completely opening up that conversation in ways that had never been opened up before. So here we are, oh, 30 plus years later, and um, that exploration has shifted and has evolved um, to include, in a very, I think, dramatic way, uh, many artists that are out there that are exploring the disability space on not just a political level, but also on an emotional and psychological level. So, Laura, I'm interested in talking to you about how this intersection of identity, political and cultural, I'll use that word cultural, um, is being expressed in many of the artists that you know and have met over the past decade or so. It's totally intersectional. It covers everything, right? So was, I think before maybe it was more narrowly focused because people were just trying to get their basic civil rights. And with the opening up of at least some of those, it opens up to all the rest of the aspects of what make us human. So there's gender, there's race, there's culture, there's class, there are all the other aspects of what make us human. So it's the idea of the personal becomes political. Uh -huh. This is what this is. Uh -huh. You know, it's real about really about identity politics. 
politics, uh-huh. if you're talking politics at all. And sometimes you're not. You're just talking about people wanting to be themselves in the best ways that they can. Uh-huh. And I'm not an expert on disability culture, for the record. But as a parent and as someone who has been actively involved in the community for over 30, close to 40 years, um, I think one of the things that, that impressed me most coming out of a medical model or, or point of view to a more of a cultural point of view is that in a medical model, disability is like sort of a category that you are placed into. You're placed into the disability park and you are blind or you are autistic or you have CP. I think this artistic sort of evolution, this cultural evolution, is looking at disability more as a characteristic yes. than as a category. It seems like, and also that that too is intersectional uh-huh. because you can have one disability and another. You can cross into all kinds of different groups. Uh-huh. You, know, you can have problems with your sight and have chronic illness. Uh-huh. You can have, all of these things are possible. And in terms of opulent mobility then, uh, looking at the term opulent mobility, yes. obviously there was a connection mm-hmm. to access and mobility yes. early on in the project. Yeah. But as it has evolved, it seems as from the artwork, it has even gone broader. Yeah. And that was a, a real goal. And when I first started, it was just me trying to find spaces for my stuff and trying to find places that were wheelchair accessible, which is a whole nother challenge to talk about. But because I wanted, I, first off, because I'm a collaborative artist by nature, I work in theater and TV and film doing costumes. I love working with others. Uh-huh. I figured it had to be somebody else interested, right? So once I opened it up and didn't define what the disability was, everything else opened up. So we have work that deals with mental health issues and blindness or low sight, chronic pain, dyslexia, uh, access of all kinds, prostheses, different diseases, all the aspects of life, really. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, you know, when I think about trying to understand this world of disability as a human experience, mm-hmm. um, you can go to your own experience, which yeah. in my case happens to be physical disability. My daughter is an adult with cerebral palsy, but I don't necessarily know what it's like to be someone with a visual impairment or someone who's blind or someone who has acquired a disability through some accident. So I'm very interested in disability on a large scope, but I don't necessarily have inroads into these other experiences that I don't personally have. And I find that art (laughs) is the most powerful way to begin to think about uh, and understand disability as a human experience. Art is just such a great way to start a conversation, right? You can bring up some of the most difficult stuff out there on Earth and just gently bring people in or not, depending on the style of art, and open up a possibility for conversation that hits, I think, a real needed part of us as humans. Do we need to draw on the cave walls? I don't know, but mm-hmm. it's gone on for a really long time. It speaks to a very old part of us, uh-huh. I think. Uh-huh. Well, in terms of sort of, I, I want to I explore a little bit this differentiation that I have in my mind between, um, oftentimes when you talk to people about the disability community and the subject of art comes up, people will oftentimes are maybe familiar with art therapy, Mm -hmm. where art is used as a tool to support self-expression, which is extremely important. Of course. That having been said, the work that you're exploring with the artists that you're in touch with seems to be something far more expansive than just artist therapy. Yeah. I'm really dealing with this from a fine arts perspective Uh and trying to make sure that that's what it is. There's a lot of value to doing art therapy. There's nothing at all wrong with that. But what this is, is bringing it into a fine arts world because there are such fine artists out there and we want to actually bring that out. So but the experience then um, that we're, we're going to experience today going through the show includes work from artists who, who see themselves as fine artists. Yes. They're competing 
yes. out there in the world as mm -hmm. fine artists. So their work is 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 both. I mean, it comes at so many different levels. It yeah. comes at an intellectual level, a creative level, an artistic level, a financial level. These are people who are trying to carve out a career as artists. Is that yes? It? Okay. Absolutely. Now, to what level they're doing that depends on the person. Right. Right. But all of these people are trying to actually bring their art at work out and sell it in a competitive market. All right. Well, what we're going to do then is we're going to walk through uh, right. so that people get a good feel for the show itself. And again, um, I encourage you to, uh, if you're in the San Gabriel Valley, certainly to put it on your calendar and come out to Wing Walker Brewery between now and October 30th. Well, here we are at the beginning of the show, and you are with a couple of uh, ladies that you happen to be uh, familiar with. Yes. This is my Kali Walker, and this is Medusa. So Kali is based on an aluminum walker that clearly I've dolled up a bit. Wow. And built her. Uh, she's cardboard and a lot of gaff tape, uh -huh. mostly uh, priority mailboxes and coffee canisters, and stuffed with remnants of all of my projects, and covered in leather, a lot of thrift store leather. So jackets, pants, some purse. There's a little sofa. Uh -huh. Yeah, I had a, a pleasure at the opening of taking a close look in all of this material. I think that you have it listed as like sort of mixed material, but there's this great leather thing going on mm -hmm. here. Now, can you tell us a little bit about the narrative behind your piece here? Yes. Well, first off, Kali is the goddess of time and empowerment and a ferocious slayer of demons. But the basic thing behind the piece is that Death and disability happen to us all if we are fortunate enough to live long enough and make it through whatever slings and arrows that life throws at us. And she's here to remind us of that and to make every moment of that awesome. <laughs> and then over here, who do we have? We have Medusa. Uh-huh. She's built into a vintage wheelchair that was donated to me, actually. Yeah, you must have been very, I was looking at this the other night, you must have been very excited when you got a hold this of this one. This is amazing. Uh -huh. I think it's Korean War era. Wow. It's gorgeous. Obviously, I've, I've tricked it out just a bit. Yeah, just a bit, huh? <laughs> uh, that's great. But this is imagining Medusa as though she was turned into a Gorgon by a vengeful god, and... Um, uh, she was just an innocent maiden being over at Athena's temple, and there she was, and Poseidon raped her. Oh, and so instead of getting mad at Poseidon, Athena turns her into a gorgon, which is totally unfair. But I imagined her as a, a queen who'd become one with her serpents. Mm. You know, if Very these powerful. are the ones you have, these become your friends. Very powerful. And she's more representative of the amount of disabled people who are sexually abused and assaulted. Wow. Which is an inordinately high number. Uh -huh. Well, it's a beautiful piece. Thank you. We yeah. have over here. This is Cat Chewy's medication piece, uh -huh. which is really wonderful. They came up with the idea of turning something that a lot of people think of as just a pragmatic thing or a medical need into an item of comfort. So wow. these all represent medication doses. Oh my gosh. Which is lovely. Uh -huh. Something that uh, can't help but tell a story. What do we have here? Absolutely. These are Marita Pikes. Um, this is about a disease issue that she has, ataxia. And you can, not even knowing very much about the disease, you can feel it as something melting your neural net. She uses a combination of paper, paper clay, epoxy, and wire. Wow. And it's really just wonderfully evocative. It also has that cocoon chrysalis feeling. Uh -huh. A lot of people, when you talk about the whole butterfly experience, they don't mention that the caterpillar literally is dissolving into mush uh, in the chrysalis. Well, again, I think this is another example of how art captures something that is not easy to put into words. Yes. And just the whole kind of um, neurological uh, reality yeah. of ectaxia is so well presented here and powerfully so. Uh, Noelle comes to us from out of Ireland. One of the things I really love about doing this show is that we can take digital files from anywhere. So she sent them to me, I printed them out. But this, Genevieve, is her 
car that she built out of wheelchair parts. But I love just the imaginative nature of this. Like, there's an old barrel. That's the back of a perambulator hood as the top. There's a, the front seat, or oh. front wheels is the steering wheel. We're looking at a photograph, but this is yeah. really a, a sculpture. Yes, uh -huh. and a fabulous one. And how did this person find you? This, honestly, I've been finding more people out of Instagram. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Which is kind of fabulous. Yes. Uh, and Megan's piece. Uh-huh. And how beautiful is that? This is chlorophyll printing. Uh -huh. So she comes up with this technique of printing on the leaves himself using photosynthesis. I still don't even know. I, can't, I try to imagine it in my head. I'm not even quite sure how I understand that, but it is quite dramatic. Isn't it amazing? And this one in particular in Crip Time is about the experience of disability and the time that things take. So things don't happen in an efficient manner. Mm -hmm. Let's just say it takes in crypt time. It takes the time it takes. In it's crypt like, time, I think one of the things interesting that I find about crypt time, it's not, we're not referencing something that you turn on and turn off. No, no. It is crypt time. <laughs> it, it does what it does. Uh, and, and people you, need to sort of appreciate that because if you, you happen to know someone who requires uh, more time either to communicate or to move, um, the rest of us have to be able to make that adjustment. And again, I think that art brings these issues to light so that people can begin to think of them. Yeah. Huh? Actually, I do not know if this was a self-portrait. I, um, Bronte Grimm uses several different models, but this one do not, su does not suffice. It's sort of about the supposed banquet that people will offer to disabled people by offering like the barest minimum of access hmm. and thinking it's a wonderful gift when really it's such a tiny thing you can't actually even get a bite out of it. Well, I'll tell you, knowing that and appreciating that, it is so, oh, it's almost like a dream. Yes. But at the same time, this idea of supposedly being grateful for crumbs that fall off the table. Yes. Is so well executed. Isn't it? And powerfully so. It's just a lovely idea. It's it's almost fairy tale like. Yeah. So okay. here we, we have three, three different artists. This is Kira Chapman, who comes from out of Ireland, and her, her representation of chronic pain. Mm. Um, this comes from a book project she's put together, the Chronic Pain Diaries, and I don't know where it's out, but it's just come out fairly recently. But what a lovely image! It's the idea is something that is so pervasive and takes over so much of your life, why is it not visible to anyone else? Mm. That on the outside it may seem amazing, but in the inside it is tearing you apart and ripping around your neck and arms and legs and every part of you. Well, top here. David Isaacson, he's a neurodiverse artist and he does these wonderful, like Dada-esque just suppositions of stuff. But if you've never experienced the notion of a party line, because it's an old school thing, it used to be that you'd have multiple phones on one, sim uh, one system and people would literally have to push in the wires. And sometimes those wires would get crossed uh -huh. and there would be multiple people on that. Mm -hmm. I've, I've actually experienced a real party line. Not so many people today do. But this is the idea of it. What happens when your wires are crossed? But because David is David, he's also given it the political implications of crossing the party lines and the lines getting crossed. And it's just a lovely evocative piece. And also not a bad photograph. Well, for um, Emily Maturoni, mm -hmm. who is out of the East. Um, I don't always like collage work, uh -huh. but she does these amazing fanciful things of glamorous people in these festive utility vehicles. Ah. So she turns rocking horses and chaise lounges and sofas into wheelchairs. Now, any uh, is this typical of her size that she's doing? Because these are three inch by three inch. Yeah, the amuse bouche of art. Uh -huh. So <laughs> does she work just in smaller formats? Nope. She no. does it in all different kinds of sizes. So uh -huh. this particular one, she's it's been very cute. Uh -huh. This artist comes to us from out of Belgium, also sending in digital files. But I love these pieces. These are a series of antique collars that are pierced through in braille, spelling out the names, supposedly of the owners of uh, said collars. Uh -huh. So as an original installation, it came along with a braille alphabet book. So uh -huh. you could read the names of the people. 
Well, you know, people think of Braille as purely functional, but I've seen some work by artists where they're actually looking at it in an aesthetic context, yeah, and it's which is really, amazing. yeah, it's it's a it's a it's it's a terrific way to approach. I think some of these artifacts of disability that we've locked into, you know, a very narrow frame of mind. Francesca Hummler's work. Um, I think she's now in London, but usually in, based up north in California, uh -huh. uh, is doing this work based on dyslexia. So. Wow. The idea of having these pointy things on your fingers that make it hard for you to write, mm. but also really help her embrace her creativity. Now, when you have these artists and they've been selected for the show, yes, do you wind up having just sort of an ongoing kind of dialogue with some of these artists? Absolutely, mm -hmm. I end up sharing the work of theirs throughout the years, following them, and keep you know keeping up with what they're doing lately. Um, I have several people who are returning artists. Uh -huh. And here we have Jenny Julia, who comes to us from out of Finland. Uh -huh. And what a lovely, evocative piece this is. So this is a wearable art piece. It's, am I your inspiration, really? But the idea is, okay, well, if you're really walking up to people in wheelchairs and saying, oh, you're just such an inspiration, like, really? Well, if I'm that cool, how about you wear it? No, oh, my daughter gets people <laughs> patting her on the head. Oh, my God. She's 38 so years old. No, not cool. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Yeah, now, again, some of this work is powerful in its content, but also has this kind of layer of humor. Which yeah. I love. Uh -huh. I mean, that's, that's a real choice for me, because I love that this is a great way to communicate to people. So you can do this between disabled and able people much more easily. Uh -huh. with something that's a little more beautiful and a little disarming. It has a little humor. All right, well, we can I, I bring up difficult conversations. Yeah. And then here. This is Teresa Shea's Rite of Passage. Uh -huh. She's local mm -hmm. to Southern California, but the prosthetic limb writing a poem. Uh-huh. So we have the Tiny muse. Dancer. Who yes. The Muse of Poetry. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Unbelievable. And where we else are we? Ellen Mann's pieces. Oh, yes, of course. Here. This is a deaf artist who's been doing these images on tile, painted images on tile, of people speaking ASL, American Sign Language. Uh -huh. And they are so joyous and bright and lively and full of emotion. So the Series A, four separate tiles, uh -huh. are all about... Friends, mm -hmm. friendship, mm -hmm. communication. This one, Series B, is about people with passion. Uh -huh. So they're all separate ASL words. And we're, we have another one of your pieces here. This is this is a piece in progress. Uh -huh. This is Melusine. He's probably eventually going to be 12 feet tall. No kidding. Wow. Yeah, it's because so, she's got an upper body and she has wings and she's got a medieval headdress. Does she reveal herself over time or do you have this in your own process? Do you sketch all this out? And I always do. I, I start with research. Part of this is because of having done a lot of costume design in history. I start with the research. Mm -hmm. And mythology has always been a huge important thing to me. Um, but so is sustainability. So this is made out of milk cartons and <laughs> stuffed with plastic and other waste, clean waste. It's better than being a hoarder, isn't it? Is it, it is. I can... But tell me again, um, how can people find out more about Opulent Mobility? Okay. You can go to the website, opulentmobility.com. And if you want specifically this show, you click on the OM 2021 link and you can either go to the main page or there'll be a drop down menu of all the different artists and you can click on all of that including the ones for the opening night performers uh -huh. which is lovely and you can also look over the whole story and other past exhibits and find out more you can come to the show and um, that's going to be up in wing walker brewery in monrovia through october 30th I will be here from 1 to 5 on Saturdays and Sundays if you want a guided tour from the curator. Uh -huh. But it's also here and mm -hmm. while I'm not. Uh -huh. But that's great. So on mm -hmm. Sundays you'll be 
here to interact with people coming to watch and yes no oh, great absolutely beautiful and uh, what's the address of Wing Walker? It is 235 West Maple, Monrovia, California. Okay. Well, we thank Wing Walker Brewery. Laura, we thank you so much. <clears throat> In closing today's show, I'd like to bring one more event to your attention. The Adapted Sports Festival this year will be held on Saturday, November 20th, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. This is an amazing event hosted by the Triumph Foundation in collaboration with Pasadena's Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Department. It's being held at Brookside Park, just by the Rose Bowl, and the address is 360 North Arroyo Boulevard, Pasadena. The event will have over 30 sports wheelchairs and sports equipment for people to use, plus coaches and instructors to teach you how to play the games. All of this is adapted for everyone, regardless of your ability or disability. Some of the sports are include archery, rugby, tennis, dance, boxing, golf, bocce, beat baseball, basketball, hand cycling, power cycle, pickleball, uh, a resource fair, an art workshop. It's just a lovely way to spend a Saturday. You need to register and registration can be found at www.triumph-foundation dot org that's o-r-g forward slash a-s-f information about covid19 safety protocols will be provided to register participants in advance of the event sponsors are needed and volunteers are needed so if you haven't been there you gotta put it on your calendar if you've been there before, we look forward to seeing you again. Again, the Adapted Sports Festival, Saturday, November 20th, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Hope to see you there.